Welcome back from uh, a very relaxing, if not slightly stressful Easter for me. I was traveling uh, around, came back uh, and hit the ground running um, to the lovely news that Boris Johnson is still uh, talking about not going. Um, and I am going to uh, preface this with um, a brief introduction about our speaker today, who has got up out of bed. I think it's about half past two in the morning where, where, where he is in New Zealand. It's, it's Phil Driver. And uh, okay. Phil, I was introduced to Phil's ideas. It must be seven or eight years ago now, I think, Phil. And least, yeah. um, I, I have to say um, that uh, we've had the the the, um, the fortune, the good fortune, to meet up a couple of times when you've been over here visiting and, and presenting. Um, and the reason I've asked Phil on and keep on badgering him is that I, I, I think his take on benefits and benefits management, um, and given its emergence into the day-to-day -day discussions that, that we have and the indications that there are from government departments and, and, and various approaches to the creation uh, and inception of projects, that, that benefits has a major role to play and in fact should always be inherent within within any business case. Phil, Phil's explanation uh, and uh, um, exposition of, of these ideas remains for me the best and, and clearest and, and possibly the most the method with most potential utility in it that I've come across. And it isn't sub submerged in jiggery pokery and complicatedness. And it, 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 it covers the broad span horizon. And for my side, um, I've done uh, some stuff which I may touch on later on in the broadcast with the controls standard that's coming out later on this year to ensure that there is a harness within which these ideas can fit. So uh, really, without further ado, Phil, because I know that you were going through the, the theory uh, of, of PRUB uh, today with a view to having a follow up, um, which will be far more conversational than this one. So we're, we have the emergent uh, exposition of all the theory and the bits and pieces that make the engine work today. So, Phil, show's yours. Uh, you've got about 30, 40 minutes to go. Um, uh, is it OK if people stick their hand up and ask a question as we're going through? That's fine with me, but I'll okay. have, yeah, yeah, um, as long as I can see them. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll invite them if I see a hand go up, Phil. Um, sounds sounds so good to me. About that. So off you go um, and welcome again. Thank you very much. And can you now see my screen? Yes, I can, yeah. Excellent. Okay. So, um, look, Steve, thanks very much for inviting me along. Um, I do get quite enthusiastic talking about this stuff. Um, so today's session is, going to, is a bit theoretical, it's introducing you to Problogic, and then session two will be particularly looking at accountability. And, and Steve, your words down the bottom there, um, the best way to articulate benefits cradle to grave. Um, I always like the sort of terminology you use, because a sentence like that really got me thinking, um, is it cradle to grave or is it cradle to maturity? Because I don't want to go have a project go from cradle to grave too quickly. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, one other point. Um, uh, yeah. If I could just interject um, yes. very, very briefly. My idea is that I realised, and, and I think it, this is where the, the light bulb went on in my head when, when I started to, to look at how you approach this, was that quite often the benefits only occur after the projects occurred. And so it was that notion of really being able to take it right through from beyond when the projects are shut down and the initial sponsors have potentially gone away, feeling that they've done their job, whereas in fact they've only created the potential for the uh, for the benefits to occur. And so I really wanted okay. to get that, that that into people's head that we could be looking anything up to 25, 30 years into the future after a project's finished. Um, so yep. the building becomes something that improves healthcare, for example. That, that's that, That's where I was coming from. Oh, look, absolutely. And I think um, the beauty of a sentence like that is that you you challenged my thinking and, um, you know, I spent a bit of time thinking about what you meant by that. So that's really cool. So look, moving on then, um, I'm, a lot of the work I've done links strategies, projects and accountability together. And what I found over and over again is those three areas often use different terminology. Um, they often don't seem to connect very well. So strategies seem to be done in a silo, projects in a silo, and accountability in another silo, and they all use different language. Um, so 
what we've done is we said, let's get out of the office. Let's describe what's happening in the physical world rather than the spreadsheets of Microsoft Project or something like that. And have a look at, well, what's the logical physical sequence we see when projects are being implemented? And can that sequence simultaneously inform strategy projects and accountability? So that was some of the thinking behind the work we did in open strategies. So today, I want to introduce you to this concept of PrubLogic. Uh, it's a simple strategy language that you can share if you've got multiple stakeholders. I'll introduce the idea of strategies and sub-strategies, a concept called orphan results, which is really important. I'll introduce you to the terms uses, and only uses create benefits. And there'll be a bit of a summary. And then I want to leave you with some questions prior to the next little um, conversation I have with you. And these are they. Who's accountable for uses? What does accountable for uses mean? And accountable to or accountable for? Is it more important to be accountable to someone or accountable for something? And I'll re um, present those questions at the end and you'll know what I mean then by uses. So this is the sort of language that pops up in strategies, projects and accountability. It's just words and words and words. It just goes on and on and on. And the question is, do all stakeholders agree on what all of these words mean? And so I've got a question for you. Do objectives contribute to goals or do goals contribute to objectives? Or are goals the same as objectives? Now, I don't know if you can, you're can. you happy to use um, chat to just uh, type in a number one, two, or three as to what you think your answers are. I don't know, Steve, if you can monitor the answers coming through. Uh, uh, yeah, know. I'll have a look. Are, are you advancing slides, or do you think you're advancing slides, Phil? I think I'm advancing slides. Are they yeah, not so advancing? I'm, st I'm, st I'm stuck on number one at the moment. Oh, dear, because I'm definitely advancing them. Um, <laughs> I can't see what I'm sharing screen. Um, yeah, I've got, that, I've got, I've got your page five there now. A question for you. Do so if I, bills? So yeah. if I go back to that, do you see yeah. question for you? Do you see that advancing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So look, look to, to cut a long story short, I asked this question when I ran a webinar for the Project Management Institute and again for the APM. And the answers were split to roughly a third, a third, a third. And that was without saying, what do you think the meanings of outputs, outcomes, results, benefits, or impacts are? And so what I found is just about everybody I talked to has different meanings for these words. And there's a chap in the USA running a group called STRAT-ML, Strategic Markup Language, and he's trying to put universal definitions on all of those words, and 10 years later, he's still trying. There's just too many meanings for all those words, and there's too many words. And we've got human cognitive limits. So you may know Miller's Law, people can work with seven plus or minus two ideas. I think that's optimistic for many people. In my experience, people can work with just three to four ideas at any one time. And another limit is if we have a diagram, how many bits of information can people cope with? And I've, Phil, I've tested this. Your slides aren't, Phil, your slides aren't advancing again. I can't comprehend what, anybody got any idea why that would be happening? I can go back to this screen if you like. It's gone on to seven now, slide seven now, the human cognitive limits. The second right. one with the diagrams. But it didn't what? initially. What if I page down on that? Do you, does that page down our key principle? Yeah, that seems to be working. Yeah. Okay, so I won't go full screen then. Um, so the diagram on the left, and I've tested this over and over again with a lot of people. People will read a diagram like on the left, they won't even read one on the right. It's too complex. And so I've got what I call my first law. Most people can comprehend 15 plus or minus concepts in a well-designed diagram. So these are limits. So if we're going to develop strategies or complex plans, we've got to keep them simple. So this is our key principle, smallest amount of strategic information that has the highest value to the most people. So let's get out there into the real world. What do we see happening in the real world of projects? 
this is what we see. We see people building or creating or maintaining stuff and people use that to gain benefits. And that is what happens in the real world. And that leads to our universal sequence called prub logic or prub. People run projects that create results people use to get a benefit. And we haven't found anything, any project that doesn't meet that sequence. So the projects create assets. They enable and motivate people to use those assets to get a benefit. So the project could be build a swimming pool, the result is you've got one, people use it and you get a benefit. And you'll notice here, I've got an arrow that says projects create results. They usually do because somebody's managing it. I've got different language in here, and this is crucial. Uses are almost always voluntary. You cannot automatically assume they will happen. So you have to hand over the result to be voluntarily used and it's the use that creates the benefit. So this bit in here is the weak bit in many strategies because it is assumed that results will be used to create the benefit. And we see phrases like benefits realization, how the project is supposed to realize the benefit. And I don't believe that that is true because a project manager cannot make a use happen. And I'll, I'll expand on that in a minute. So here's two very simple examples. First project, manufacture and distribute our company's products. The result is the products are available, people use them, they're happy and the company's profitable. Another simple one, build a cycleway, you've got a cycleway, kids ride on it and they're safe. And they're ultra simple examples. And I'm gonna give you a more detailed one in a minute. So with PRUB, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go on to the main slide here. Do you see that as, the, as a full screen slide now? Hopefully. So planning goes from right to left. So strategy goes from right to left. Implementation goes from left to right. If you're doing your planning, you've got to understand uses and benefits before you try and design your projects and results. And I'm now gonna work through an example that demonstrated that, and it's a fairly earthy example. Um, when we had the earthquakes in Canterbury, half of our city ended up with no water, no power, no sewerage system, no, no supermarkets, almost nothing, and seriously da damaged roads. So the council had to step in and do something about that. So the first thing they did was say, we've got to get toilets to everybody, chemical toilets. So the project was deliver 30,000 chemical toilets to Christchurch homes, results, people have got them, families use them, and we've got high levels of hygiene. And they achieved that in about three days. They got 30,000 toilets from China. Amazing. And the question is, is that use complete? Is that a full use or is it not complete? And the answer is, well, actually, it's not complete at all. Um, because people need to use and empty their chemical toilets. So the city had to rush around and put big disposal tanks on the corners of all the streets so that people could empty their toilets because you couldn't empty your toilet down the drain because your toilets didn't work. Was that enough? Well, actually, no, it wasn't because we had to empty them into clean disposal tanks. So they had to have a project to regularly clean the sewage tanks. And is that sufficient? Well, no, it isn't actually because people needed to empty their toilets and clean and sanitize their chemical toilets. But they had no chemicals because there were no supermarkets, they couldn't buy them. So we had to add another project that said, deliver cleaning chemicals to everybody. So now people have got the chemicals, now they can actually do that use. They can use the toilet, empty it and clean it. Is that sufficient? Well, it's not actually because there's another use. Elderly and frail people couldn't lift the toilets. So they had to be emptied and cleaned by somebody else. So we had to get some projects to train and employ people to empty the toilets so the old people could use them. So what I'm demonstrating here is that as you understand the uses, the projects and results become blindingly obvious. And that's the thing, you don't start with the projects. Understand uses and benefits, 
and they tell you what project results to you, that you need. So this is the inconvenient truth. Only uses create benefits. Projects don't create benefits. Results don't create benefits. Project managers cannot realize benefits themselves. It's the use creates the benefit. And the use will only happen if it's the right results that are necessary and sufficient. So if we go back to this picture here, all four of those results were necessary to, and sufficient. Any one of them wasn't enough. So when you're going ahead with a project and you're hoping to get benefits arising somewhere down the track, have you got all the results and will the results actually be used? So you can't have any shortcuts. To be effective, a project must lead to results. Results must lead to uses and uses must lead to benefits. So that's our ideal world, isn't it? So however, and here's the ideal world, projects lead to results, lead to uses, lead to benefits. However, very often projects produce results that nobody uses. And years ago, I had a conversation with one of the directors of PwC in London, and I speculated that about 15% of all public money is spent on projects to produce orphan results. And he roared with laughter. He said, no, it's nothing like that. It's at least 40%, four zero. Kind of alarming, isn't it? Think of the money that could be saved if government money wasn't spent on projects produced abandoned orphan results. But the good news is some projects produce results that get adopted by other projects to produce a result that people use to get a benefit. So here's an example. The first project is designing new products and that produces an orphan result, a set of designs. So those designs aren't going to be used by the end user but they're certainly going to be used by the production team who create the products and market them, leading to products being available, people use them, benef benefits to the end user and the company's profitable. Here's a larger one. This is a real one, water management for uh, uh, multiple catchments in Canterbury, which is where I live. And I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but the key thing is the first project was about collecting information about what's needed. That produces an orphan result of a whole lot of information. That doesn't get immediately used. It feeds back into a project to refine the regulations. It feeds back into a project to work out what resources we need. And then ultimately, when you've got the information plus the regulations plus the resources, leads to project four, which is to disseminate all this information to the end users, the result of which end users have all that information and the resources, and they can either directly use the water in the catchment commercially, non-commercially, or nature uses the water, or they use that information to improve the water assets, build, um, storage dams, build irrigation systems. Now you've got better systems which people can use. So most strategies have a whole sequence of orphan results and as long as they are adopted, that's fine. But a key point in this diagram is this, the only actions that made any difference in the catchment are the project number five and the three uses. Everything else is precursors to those actions that actually change water management. And further to that, nothing is worth doing unless this happens, unless the results four and five are actually used. And in our experience, this is where the vast majority of public sector strategies break down. They do all sorts of beautiful projects, they produce beautiful results and nobody uses them or they use them in different ways from what is anticipated. So in our sequence, evidence of that a project will create a result sort of sits on the linkage between the project and the result. Will the project create the result? Similarly between results and uses, uses and benefits. But the most important evidence before you start any project is to confirm, absolutely confirm that the results will be used. And if you can't confirm that, 
then don't start the project. And I've very, very often seen um, people putting in um, or responding to tender documents and claiming all sorts of uses and benefits from the new road or the new bridge or the new library, simply because they need to claim that benefit in order to get the contract to run the project. But there's no compelling evidence of that, that that use will happen. So very few end user actions can be compelled. End users need to be inspired. We can't control or manage them. So we've got to understand what the users want to do and why before we can design projects and results. And we've got to understand uses as defined by the users, not as imagined by us. We've got to ask the user, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? And so I'm going to summarize and then pose a couple of questions. So multi-stakeholder strategies, first of all, I've got to use a succinct language that we all understand. And PRUB is the simplest set of words we've been able to find. We don't have objective goals, missions, targets, and all that stuff. So we can represent any strategy by prob logic in the form of what we call substrategies. Only uses create benefits. And can I encourage you to say this to yourself at the start of every day? Don't assume uses and benefits. Find out what the user believes are the uses and benefits. And uses are voluntary. So we've got to understand them so that people are inspired to use the use. So the use requires results that are both necessary and sufficient. So if uses don't happen, there's no point doing the projects because you're not going to get the benefits. So how can we ensure that uses happen? They're voluntary. How can we ensure that? So that leads to my homework questions for you. Who is accountable for uses? And what does being accountable for uses actually mean? And then there's a the final question, what matters? Is it being accountable to someone? Is it being accountable to central government? Or is it more important to be accountable for achieving something? And if you've achieved something, does it matter who you're accountable to? So, Steve, that's my my presentation. Um, I did it in less than 30 minutes. You certainly um, did. I'm very happy to have questions. I'm not, I'd, I'd rather avoid answering these final questions at this stage. So my, you know, I, I welcome questions on prob logic, on uses, benefits, and so on. So over to you guys. Well, I'll open. Oh, OK, Karen. Hi. Go on. <laughs> Hi, I'm just trying to put my camera on. Um, I might regret on asking this because it, <laughs> it might be a, a sort of a, I mean, I, there aren't any silly questions. Um, this logic has been apparent to most of us working in the project profession for decades and decades and decades. So the interesting question for me is, and I totally agree with you, Phil, absolutely. I love the simple way you presented it. Um, what are the barriers to making it happen? And I suppose it's these questions you're talking about here, isn't it? Is how do we make, how do we get answers to those things and make it happen in reality? That this thinking is done before we start building loads of projects. <laughs> That's a, probably the best question I could be asked. Um, and the answer is it is incredibly difficult. And the reason being is that PRUB is so transparent that many people run a mile. They don't want their pet projects to be questioned in this way. They simply want to spend the money on the new theater. They don't want to justify the number of uses because they've decided in their head that spending the money on the new theater or the new bridge is the right thing to do. And PRUB is too transparent for them. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's the, the politics and the vested interests getting in the way, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it absolutely is. And Adrian asked a question um, in an email to me is, you know, how do you get the Sir Humphreys out of the way? And I have that challenge working with the, you know, consulting with the, the local authority is that um, it's very, very difficult. As soon as you start saying, where's your evidence for that, um, they change the topic. And, 
you know, at a recent workshop I ran, I had to do the full on power dressing, you know, white tall male going right up close to this person and sort of looking down at them saying, you know, where is your evidence? And it just didn't want to answer. Um, and the problem is after the meeting, he resumes a position of control. So it is very difficult. I've tried confronting people head on like that. I've tried being very, very gentle with them. Um, I've tried all sorts of approaches. And I've got to the point where if people won't, aren't prepared to be transparent, I go and work for someone else. And there was a lovely quote from a scientist, and I wish I knew who he was, where somebody said to him, how did you convince all the people that disagreed with you? And he said, I didn't, they died. The other thing that springs to mind is it's easier to ask forgiveness than to get permission. So <laughs> well, well, anyway, yes. thank you for well, I mean, that quote is very much the approach we tend to take in New Zealand, just get on with it and then ask for permission. And I did find when I had four years in the UK that um, people in the UK were far more inclined to ask for permission rather than get on with it. And I think we're a bit more bloody minded over here. Um, we just do it. <laughs> Martin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, Phil. Um, we actually met a few years ago, um, so it's nice to nice to see you again um, and get a bit of a refresher on prom. Um, I think one of the things that struck me over the last few years, because I've I've sort of tried to apply this principle, maybe not always in in the same wording, but in the same sort of mentality and uh, ethos, I suppose. Um, one of the biggest challenges we found is governance around this, particularly stemming from the business case. Um, I won't name the organisation that I've recently done some work with, but it was a multi-million pound business case that was signed off. Two years later, they did an audit and found that there were absolutely no benefits in the business case itself, um, right. to start with, let alone what was actually being realised. Um, and I think we, the way I've always thought about it is the mentality and the mindset of people in organisations who are actually doing, making the decisions is one of the biggest challenges to, to or big, one of the biggest hurdles to get over because they've just done the same thing the same way year after year, decade after decade, because they've been trained that way. And all they want to wor worry about and get beaten up on is time and cost, yep. not the actual benefits and the uses of the benefits um, overall. So one of the, you know when when I go into a sort of an engagement as a consultant the first thing that we do is more around getting people to think in the right way rather than trying to you know put a whole framework in place because actually that can be that can take months to to even get people just shifting their mindset a bit but um yep. yeah it's, it's it's really gratifying to hear you know this is this is still still going and it's it's I think we just need to kind of almost create a bit of a, a momentum around it, you know, in the industry, shifting the industry is going to be one of the biggest challenges, but it's, it's yep. essential. Yes, and I guess what I find is that if we're trying to bring other people on board, it's very tempting to have all sorts of conversations around all sorts of topics and subtopics and whatever. And I find that if you immediately home in on the uses that clarifies things and actually do a PRUB diagram in front of people. Um, when I run workshops, I use what I call a sticky wall. It's a piece of fabric that I put up on the wall and I can stick bits of paper to it. And I put the four headings, project result, use benefit, and I talk through in front of people. So what is this result that you're wanting? Okay, it's a new bridge. So how's that going to be used? And I find over and over again, people want to go on and on and on about the project. And, to, and I say, yep, I get that. Can we now talk about the uses? And it becomes very clear that most people don't even think about the uses. They, they go project result benefit. And that is the weakness in the current system is that we are leaving out the uses and the uses are voluntary. You cannot control them. You cannot manage them. 
And so that comes back to making sure that you really, really understand the use and therefore what the user needs, i.e. what is the necessary and sufficient set of results that will enable the use. Because over and over again, I've seen beautiful products come on the market that nobody knows anything about. If it's not, if, if you haven't got the marketing as well as the, the product itself, it won't get used. And I did some work for a borough council in London, and I won't say who they were, but they called me in just before they were going to open a new leisure centre. And they said, let's prub it just to make sure we've covered all the bases. So I said, well, who's going to use this? And they said, oh, school kids are going to use it. And I said, well, when are they going to use it? They said, oh, during the daytime. I said, have you discussed that with the teachers? And there was the stony silence. And so they hadn't actually discussed whether the schools would bring the kids to the swimming pool. And so I then said, well, how are the kids going to get there? They said, by bus. And I said, have you got bus parking outside the leisure centre? And there was another stony silence. And I couldn't believe it. And I had, a, it's funny, swimming pools come up quite a lot. I had a similar experience here where a local authority was going to put in a, a large swimming pool, a beautiful Olympic sized swimming pool in the main town, which had a number of satellite towns all around it. And the satellite towns currently all had small swimming pools. So I said to them, well, look, this was great. You've done a good strategy on the big swimming pool. Who's going to continue to use the small, small swimming pools or are you going to shut them down? And the mayor, stepped up and changed the subject he would not allow the meeting to answer that question because they hadn't considered the disbenefits of having the big pool was going to mean all the little pools were going to become completely uneconomic the same applies to the centralization of hospitals sure that makes it much cheaper for whoever is running the hospital but it makes it a lot more expensive for the user who can no longer go to the local hospital, they've got to travel a long way to a central hospital and pay for accommodation. And so they don't want to do it. So I, I did quite a bit of work with British Telecom back in about 2004, five, and we had a clever software tool that did prub stuff really, really well. And the British Telecom guy said, Phil, forget about the software. It's all about the uses. And it was one of the best bits of advice I've ever had because the uses are the things that people avoid and the voluntary nature of the uses is what gets avoided. Right, okay, thank, thank you, Martin. Um, is that Ivan on video there? Yes, that's me. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phil, uh, nice to meet you. This is the first time that I heard this uh, topic and it's really interesting. Um, and just hearing your, your explanation, one of the things that came to me is I work in IT projects yep. and um, right now there is a lot of talk about these new methodologies like Agile and so on that we call predictive and, uh, sorry, iterative and yep. dynamic methodologies. So a lot of what I see here, especially that engagement with the users on what the use is going to be, is kind of the basics and the kind of... Uh, key elements of these new methodologies. So how do you see this logic apply to these new approaches like Agile? Oh, it's it's absolutely consistent. And when we um, had our software tool, in fact, we still got a software tool and I was working with my software engineers, they were very much using Agile. And it was interesting, the software guy applied my own logic to me. And he said to me, Phil, what are the, well, so how are people going to use the software? And I kept saying, look, just write the software. It's got to do X, Y, Z. And he said, Phil, you're telling us we have to understand uses. And now you yourself are not clear on the uses. So he made me write down a whole lot of use cases. And I found it incredibly irritating. So I can understand why people don't want to write down the uses. It's messy. It's really messy trying to understand what people want to do. But it was an incredible learning experience for me because once I started trying to answer that question, what do people want to do with the software? I knew what I wanted to do with it. I could answer that question dead easy. What did other people want to do with it was a profoundly different question, very sobering. 
And so I had to go out and talk to the people who were keen on what we were doing and find out what they wanted. So look, it's absolutely consistent with Agile. <laughs> I guess what we've done with PRUB is to make it as simplest, simple and clear as possible. It's not I think about- it really, I think it would, yes, I think it supports and reinforces Agile's uh, intentions, which is to delight the customer, isn't it? Something like that, is that the- uh one of the imperatives of, of Agile, because there's a danger in giving the customer what they want, because <laughs> the because the bitter, embittered, experienced con consultant in me says that quite often we used to end up giving them what they wanted rather than what than what they needed, yep. even even though we knew what was needed. And so to square the circle with Martin, there are these embarrassing mm -hmm. situations where you're bidding for work, maybe as a major contractor for a huge infrastructure project. And uh, you know full well that it's not the right thing. Do you have a duty of care, you know, an ethical duty of care to stick your hand up? Or should there be governance, which requires duty of care to say, you're not actually doing the right thing? Um, well, or maybe you get yeah. through it by asking about the use case all the time until they realise that they maybe haven't quite figured it out. Well, that's the topic of my next seminar is exactly yeah, I'll, how, I, I, was, yeah. I, I want to steer away from that if I can. But <laughs> I, I, um, do you, uh, Ivan, so do you feel comfortable with this logic as an approach? Oh, yeah. No, it, yeah. it is perfect. And actually, I was thinking, and again, I think that that's the topic for the next one. But if mm. you follow the logic from, from the use case or the users to the benefits, that's what the real value of, of methodologies like Agile yeah. uh, really, really, really fit because you, you have that that logical step from, from, okay, well, this is the use case. Well, this is the use case and it's the right one. Guess what? You get the fan of it, I yeah. hope. <laughs> well, that was, that, for me, that, as I said before, opening up, this, that was the revelation. It was that it, you only get the benefits from use. You can make as many bits and pieces as possible, but if, if somebody doesn't pick it up and use it, and if the outcome of that use, although it could be different, uh, if something like that doesn't occur, then you've wasted your time. And and, yep. and the, the bit about the orphan is it's often more by luck than judgment that I'll give a big example. The Millennium Dome got built, but nobody thought it was going to be the most popular entertainment venue and the most lucrative uh, uh, and profitable entertainment venue in the world, did it? That, it didn't get built for those reasons. And yet, thankfully, it, it, uh, it, it got repurposed to, to do that thing. Yep. Uh, but, but the strategies helped you, help you account and, uh, and rationalize that. Um, Roger, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I, I found Speak. it really interesting. Um, my background is clinical research, and sometimes you might get a project which is going to be five to six years or something, where you're looking at a new drug which you're trialling. Um, one of the things that happens is perhaps the uses change during that time because people come up with different treatments and different things which you weren't aware of at the beginning. Uh, I thought this would be a really good way of actually perhaps closing down projects which are not going to work anymore, even though they started off as being very rational. Have you ever used it in that sort of term? And do you sort of look at uses on a regular basis to see if they've changed? Look, that's a really good question. Um, I, in a previous life, I used to manage a lot of, uh, you know, a big team of researchers, and I always said to them, it might be difficult to get a research project off the ground. It's even more difficult to stop it. And so, yes, it, it's very difficult to stop a project once people are committed to it, their careers are committed to it, they've written all sorts of papers on the subject and they still believe in it. And um, yes, the PRUB logic is worth applying over and over again. Is the use still going to happen? Is the same benefit going to be achieved? And so, I've used it, I guess, informally, but um, not not in a you know fully structured sense to terminate projects. But I believe it is a powerful tool for doing exactly that. Yes, that's what I thought. I thought it sort of came over to me as being something that could be really useful in in sort of my sphere. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Well, I think related to that is. Um, where rather than stopping a project, you might change a project. And a classic might be yeah. where um, somebody says, we need a swimming pool. So they start building a swimming pool because their belief is kids are going to swim in it and get healthy. And then you actually talk to the kids and say, why do you swim in the swimming pool? And they say, because I want to see members of the opposite sex. 
they're not there for the health benefit. That's a byproduct. But if they're there to see members of the opposite sex, why not add a cafe to the um, to the swimming pool, add other things that enable these young kids to socialize so they will get the health benefit as a byproduct. Um, so the, the benefit that the child is looking for has to be in their mind, not your mind. Yeah. In, in my experience, the easiest way to shut down a research project, Phil, is to run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, otherwise, well, I, they tend to, otherwise, they tend to hurt along until they spent it all. Well, I, I worked for a company where the chief exec said to me, if you ask a scientist how long it's going to take and how much it'll cost, it'll be six months and $100,000, and you get the same answer six months later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, th th there is a... A, what, a serious budgetary issue there, I think. Uh, but the repurposing, I think, is the key key factor. So rather than signing your own death warrant, um, having the having a get out of jail card in there somewhere again is where the subroutines and and hooking up orphan projects is is, is again probably for the next uh, session. Andrew Edkins, yep. hello. Hello, Phil. Hello, Steve. Um, so Phil, really interesting. Um, presentation um, I guess I don't wanna, I was going to ask a, a, a question that I think might just be best um, addressed next week so do you I'm curious as to whether you've experienced ben, the, the most success with the kind of logic behind prub in where where you get project management operating in a kind of systems engineering paradigm I'm thinking very much about those projects where everything is about the use and the benefits so particularly things like aerospace where you don't want planes falling out the sky or space missions or things like that so do you do you, do you think that it, if you come from a background of systems engineering you you would factor prub in more than you would if you came for uh, came at project management from say i don't know a construction or a policy making setting Yes, I think you would. I mean, a, a lot of my work has been public sector, particularly local authority rather than aerospace. But if I think of um, the use on, uh, you know, somebody flying, what is the use? Are they just flying from A to B? And I would argue, no, that's not sufficient. They are flying from A to B and in their mind, it is safe. So they're not going to do it if they think it is not safe. So not only does the aircraft have to be safe, but the safeness of the aircraft has to be conveyed to the end user. So I would see really, really understanding what is the user experience? Um, is it just flying or is it more than that? And, and so I don't know if that's a, a sufficient answer. I haven't spent a lot of time on that scale of activity, but invariably it's the human element that stops the use from happening. You know, something's missing, the information's missing, the marketing's missing, it just doesn't feel right. And getting into that sort of social science, I think, is something as engineers we perhaps don't do. We rely on logic a little bit too much. And mm. PRUB is logical. That's why I have it there. But understanding the psychological elements of uses is crucial. And I think we, we can all learn a lot in that space. I've certainly learned a heck of a lot because I'm a white male engineer and I think, you know, logic should should prevail. And I've learned through life that it doesn't. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, very, very quick question before we bring the next questioner on. Do you think use can be turned, can and or should be turned into a number, Phil? Yes, yeah, so whenever we have a use, we always say, okay, so how many, how often? So there's a project going on in town here to redevelop the city centre. So like most cities, the sh main shopping retail areas are dying because of internet shopping and COVID and various other things. So the council's proposing to have a new bus stop, a better bus stop and green, you know, green trees on the street, and that's going to make a difference. And so my question to them is, OK, will it just make it nicer for the people who are coming into town anyway, or will it attract more people? And if so, will they just come in once a year 
or is it going to attract people to come in every day? Where's your data? So yes, numbers have to be in there. And mm -hmm. if it's only going to be 10 people a week, you can't justify the new trees. But if it's a thousand a day, it's starting to look worthwhile. So yes, you've got to put numbers on on the uses. Um, I'm, but, I'm yeah, the, the direction of that question really is, should it be factored into estimating and forecasting and, or whatever modeling's taking place in order to, because again, from what you've said, it almost seems as though it's, it's, it's almost impossible to get to that um, in the way that we structure our um, process for project approval. Uh, Absolutely, um, which will morph nicely into my next presentation. Yeah, okay, I'll shut up again then. Um, <laughs> That's all right. I mean, I they're, they're, they're spot on questions, and this yeah. is what I, where I feel PRUB is incredibly powerful because think, it links, yeah. links your strategy to your projects, to your accountability. It's making and, you think. Yeah. yeah. Well, the ownership of <clears> uses <throat> and what does accountability for uses mean is actually yeah. a very deep question. Yeah. Um, I, I saw somebody had a, their hand up. It was Naslia Aladini? Is that right? Or have they gone? Correct. Hello. Yes. Oh, hello. What's your question? Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you see the necessity of uh, n the projects that we, uh, like uh, Artemis 1, that we are, uh, NASA is uh, traveling beyond the moon and back, and so it's extending the horizons of humans' uh, experience, and we'll face new um, challenges that could be beneficial for the future. Also, that um, the other um, topic or point I want to make is there are some academic researches, for example, in uh, making medications that needs to uh, very ex extensive trials and uh, it should be funded by the government and not private sectors and perhaps also um, um, for the sake of uh, um, um, neutrality of the, the funds. Uh, the, the, mm. Thank you. Okay, so I think there are projects that can just be project driven with no uses identified whatsoever. The blue skies stuff, we can't shut down all the blue skies. And so in New Zealand, our government funds about 90% of the research has to have an endpoint, and about 10% is just purely curiosity driven. And if it's purely, purely curiosity driven, I think it's still worth asking at some point, well, what might the uses be with no evidence that they'll ever happen? So yes, there's definitely room for blue skies exploration. Um, and then the uses will emerge rather than being something we're confident about at the beginning. But I would hate to think that we were going to build a bridge and hoping that the uses would emerge, I think. <laughs> of majority of what we do in the real world, you can predetermine the uses. So thank you for your question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Maren Simpson, I think you've got your hand up. Thank you, yes. Um, thanks, thank you. Um, I was just struck by um, Karen's question about the fact that it's been apparent for decades, um, uh, how, how, you know, that, that this is an issue, but how do we, how do we uh, sort of get get over those those issues? And also, Martin, hello, Martin, nice to see you again. Um, the mentality of people is difficult to get over. I've got an example where um, it's from the health sector, and it's it's um, a group of uh, uh, it's a um, a GP who works in A and E at the Children's Hospital in Birmingham, Women's and Children's Hospital, and a consultant who also works in A and E. And they noticed that um, less than 10% of the children that were coming from a particular part of Birmingham to A&E uh, needed to be there, in fact. And it was a, a particularly disadvantaged part of Birmingham. But people were seeing A&E as the place to take their children. So it, it, in a sense, it was the wrong use of, of something. And what they did was they sort of were trying to um, do something different. So they talked to the community in that particular area and found out what their issues were and started to work with a housing organisation as well to um, try and make a case for a, a, a children's zone, you know, a children's centre, if you like, in that area where families could, could come and, and, and come for a range, of, a range of things, not just the health elements, but a, a whole range of, 
of basics really in life that they weren't, weren't getting. Um, and so what they were doing was trying to make a, a case for something that would be used by the community to avoid the wrong use of, of A&E. And we heard about their, their story and they've, after quite a long time of, of making the case to the commissioners and, and, and the like, they've, they've managed to get a pilot, not as much money as they'd like, but a pilot. We had a discussion about whether we should do pilots or whether we should just go mainstream. And what I've come to the conclusion is that depends on the maturity of the system. In Greater Manchester, they were just going mainstream, whereas in Birmingham, they're less mature and they, they need to do pilots. Um, but one of the things that really struck me was that one of the GP, after a number of, you know, a couple of years of, of trying to get this off the ground, mm -hmm. she basically said the, the bureaucracy is taking a toll on us all. And, you know, the, so the professionals and the community are trying to work together to do something different, to change what's available to make, you know, that's going to be better in terms of uses, you know, it's going to be used much more. And yet the bureaucracy and the system are sort of working against that. And it does feel as though there's um, there's a real lag, a real drag, a real uh, risk averseness. And Martin, yeah. you kind of touched on it, I think, about shifting the industry. And almost you almost said the word movement. And I think there's something here about you know being getting together with people that want to do it differently and building a movement yeah. for change and becoming activists to make different things happen. I think that's a good example, Marin. Yeah, look, I, I like that. And uses do have to change. And yeah, you've got a head on battle here because a lot of the existing stakeholders just don't want to change. I'd just like to comment that um, Marin is one of our trained open strategies people based in Birmingham. Um, so you don't have to come all the way to New Zealand to experience open strategies if you want local input. So thanks for that, Marin. Really cool. Thanks, Marin. Andrew, have you got your hand up intentionally? Second bite, are you there? The no. hand's gone. <laughs> yes. That was no. a legacy hand. Okay. Um, I, I, I hesitate, but Karen, do you want to come back on that briefly that, as a sort of last? Does that, does Meryn's thing make sense? Uh, and no, also I, Phil's. Absolutely. I mean, as, as you know, Steve, I don't know that everybody else does, much of my career was in local government. And, but very interesting to hear people actually saying the bureaucracy killed something. Um, and I say, I know there was a, a, sort of a little bit of scepticism. Some of these ideas have been a very, and we've talked about this for, for a very, very long time. We need to start making things happen. And I think if people are starting to recognise, in fact, I'm doing um, something on sustainability at the minute, and there people are talking about bureaucracy and how do you overcome the bureaucracy. And uh, I think this, this, uh, this whole idea, I mean, thank you so much for sharing these ideas, Phil. I think this is a potentially a very useful tool. I mean, in responsible project management, we talk about the need to engage a wider range of stakeholders. And I think what doing that um, prob, um, mapping does is potentially uncover those sort of the hidden causal links that people just sort of either aren't conscious of, but making it visible. I think that's what that seems to me might be the power of that that mapping to make some of those gaps mis visible and help you ask some of those difficult questions and yep. really put sort of shape on well, what you were talking about, where you go and confront the people and they just don't answer you. Yep. That really, yep. maybe we should make, maybe we should make that a, sort of a, in the standard maybe, Steve, a mandatory thing to mm. accompany the business case to show where these links are so that it can then be monitored and we can keep checking. Is this going to yep. happen? Has something changed? Oh. That, that, that's the next okay. session again, isn't it? It's about accountability. Yeah, I think so. Um, so thank you, you very have, much indeed, Phil. Yeah, no, I'm totally yeah. on board. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Right, yep. Phil, we're, we're, we're kind of um, moving to a conclusion of, of this particular session. And I think, uh, as I hope we suspected, it's it's not necessarily told people what they didn't know already. It's just an, it's enabling them, again, to use my word, to articulate the idea uh, yep. and um, be, be able to... To sit, and in simple terms too, not not simple as in dumb, but but clear and concise, um, right. and that's and inherent with that is, I, I think is is its absolute power, um, despite the fact that it it holds it hides a multitude of complexity in the in the syntax and the the detail. But um, I wanted to um, should we just 
just briefly conclude with the homework questions again. What you want to, are these are the questions you want to ask them again? Uh, yes, so how do yep, I go away and think about? Go back to yep. my slides. So these are the questions. Um, so we've already said uses have to happen if you want to get benefits, but uses are voluntary. So who's accountable for the uses? And that leads to the really deep question. What does being accountable for uses mean? I mean, is it just identify them or does it go beyond that? And who can do anything about it? And I say that third question is, does it matter who you're accountable to if you've been accountable for something? So if you want to send your responses to me, um, that would be really cool. I think I've got my own clear answers to those questions. But I'd love to hear what other people think, because you're out there in the coalface um, experiencing um, projects or strategies that aren't working and where uses aren't happening. So I'd love to hear your views uh, ready for the next seminar. Right. Well, we, we'll have a, a discussion, Phil, about when we schedule that next one. And I think yep. I'd like to try and do it sooner rather than later, um, yep. I, I suspect. That's fine. Um, yep. A, con a concluding observation, and one that, that again made me very much want to have um, oversight organisations or, or, or let's say funding organisations, whether that's a board of directors or a government issuing funds for use. Um, I ringing in my ears soon as that statement from the audit office, who have been present on this call, um, ringing in my ears is the statement that they made to. Um, spending departments that, that they should own the benefits until they're delivered and I suppose not to try and answer that today but it seems to be entirely consistent with they're making statements like own which could be read to be accountable to or accountable for but I still don't think that system exists within government um, right. uh, uh, and is there to be answered and I think without being too uh, partisan, that instrument an, an instrument like this would help them resolve some of those questions that they're making in terms of suggestions for, to practice. Uh, it's the use of this kind of prob system which which could actually help that occur and, and come into being. So, so, um, so, so Steve, yeah. could I just ask, ask there? Could you send that quote through to me, or um, a link to that specific yes, quote? Yes, I shall. Um, because I, the I word, quote it the... often enough. I should have it ready to hand. No, okay, I, I, right. I know where it is. Okay. I'll have to go so, hunting through my email cabin. Because, because while yeah. I can get, I, I understand the point that that quote is trying to make. Mm. I would use different words to make it much, much clearer. And that's what we'll discuss next time. So yeah. it would be a really good starting point for I'll, my next I presentation. Certainly, I would certainly dig that out. Um, so you. maybe you'd be kind enough. I mean, are you, are you feeling sleepy? Slightly. <laughs> I'll come, I'll drop you, I'll drop you an email uh, and we'll um, maybe with a suggestion for a, a, a follow on date, which might not be it might be sooner than you think. I'm, I'm thinking okay. maybe three or four weeks' time. Oh, that's uh, fine with me. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Well, on that note, um, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for not falling asleep, Phil. Um, and I, I certainly don't think any of us did. Um, I, I think it's a uh, been a fan fascinating introduction, and as I said, gives rise to a lot of discussion um, uh, and many, many questions to be um uh, uh grappled with i think uh, in order to push this forward but there are also people on the call karen and, and, and nigel uh, in particular from this movement called responsible project management uh within which i believe that that, that probs would sit very well as a as a secret weapon uh, to be deployed in 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 their movement towards rpm so again i'm thinking karen if you can make sure that phil's on the receiving end of links to to what you're up to too, they may that you may well find there's a great uh, lot of opportunity for cross pollination there as well. Um, okay. So on that note, um, yes, thank you, Steve. I've yeah. already, I've already I've, emailed Phil because right. I couldn't find him on LinkedIn, so I've sent okay. him an email. <laughs> thank you. Right, good. Okay. Right, so on that note, everybody, um, have a lovely week. We will be doing a uh, broadcast next week. I think it's about continuous professional development. Mm -hmm. 
but I might be wrong. Uh, but I, I, I think it is. So um, once again, stay safe. Um, I believe it's getting a bit warmer and um, I hope to see you again next Thursday at four. And thanks again once more to, to Phil. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Nice to meet you all. Cheers. Sleep well. Thank you. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.